I will begin now. Ever since I was a child in elementary school, I despised the summer. Maybe you could relate to me in this, or maybe I'm on my own. But I, I mean, I enjoyed staying at home. I enjoyed being with my family, and I enjoyed the lack of home. But whenever I went into the summer, I felt a hole in myself. I felt like I was missing something. And that's because I longed so bad to see my friends. I longed so bad to be in that community. I longed to see them again. I waited and waited for the first day of school. COVID-19 has given me similar feelings again. Our school year that we had planned out, a lot of it we didn't get to have. We started our summer early. And this brought a little bit of despair into my life, a little bit of question. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is God allowing it? And it brought despair. I didn't understand. Maybe you felt this way over the past couple of years. I know people that probably did feel this way. When I think of the disciples throughout Jesus' ministry, I think they had a lot of questions, and a lot of anxiety, and a lot of despair, especially though during Passion Week and the week leading up to Easter and the crucifixion. If we look at it, on Saturday night, they go to this party, and there's this lady, and she she has this perfume, a way too expensive perfume, way too expensive, and she starts anointing Jesus' feet. And the disciples, you can see in the text that they're troubled. They start asking questions, and Jesus confuses them more with the things he says about this woman and the things that he says that she's doing, she's anointing him for an burial. On Sunday, Jesus comes into town riding on a donkey. And the people, they're singing Hosanna. And they're laying down their coats and mats in front of him. And they're treating him as a king. And Jesus is appointing himself as a king. On Monday, he goes into the temple. And he cleanses it. He gets the rod out of there. And he, he's acting like this priest, and people come against him, and he claims this Melchizedek authority, that he is a king, a priest of the king. And then there's the next day, and it's Tuesday. And Jesus keeps on predicting and saying he's going to go away, and predicting his death. And um, the last day he had weeped over the city, and he keeps predicting what's to come this next day. And then it's Wednesday. And Wednesday is Pass. We don't know much that happened on Wednesday. We know that they were preparing for Passover, whether it was a day rest or whatever. But Wednesday is quiet. And then we get to the day, Thursday, the day my scripture is going to come out of today. And they get up, they prepare for the Passover, and they finally get to the point where they're in community eating together. They're together. Uh, and Jesus does something, he, something unexpected. They're together and he kneels down and he starts washing their feet. What is this? The disciples protest, but Jesus comes back and says, no, this is something I must do. And he becomes a servant. He doesn't become a servant. He becomes the lowest of low servants. On this Thursday, and the disciples they have questions about this, and they get into a couple arguments, and they ask questions. And Jesus is never giving them the answer to the questions they want. He's giving them the answer to the questions they need. And this, this is, this just has to be confusing for these people. They, they don't know this, but this time of community that they're in, this time of community that they're having together, laughing, eating together, this would be one of the last times Jesus talks to them, because tomorrow. And tonight, they would be scattered. Tomorrow, Jesus would go on trial in them. Peter met Jesus' eyes when he denied him. And John, uh, Peter talked to John on the cross. But really, this is the last teaching they have from Jesus for a long time. And that brings us into John chapter 16. 
She starts by stating, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. This opening teaching, this opening line, would have resonated in with the disciples because it would have hit their hearts because they would have known in Old Testament prophecy that the vineyard is a representation of Israel's words. And by calling Jesus the true vine, they don't quite know this yet, but they're saying that all Israel's works come together in Jesus. He abides in all of them. He is bringing forth this Genesis 3.15 prophecy, first promise of a savior, that he would crush the sin but it would strike its heel. And he goes on to say, he goes on, he says, the gardener, God, cuts off every branch in you which bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. Well, so Jesus is the true vine. God's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in you that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it will be more fruitful. I don't know what you guys know about pruning. Um, growing up in an agricultural community and working in greenhouses, I've had to deadhead, so I've been around a lot. Pruning means to cut back, and it's you're taking parts of the plant, um, so and you're cutting it off so that it uses energy elsewhere. But Maybe we can't all understand pruning, but a question we can all understand is why does bad things happen to good people? And this is kind of the question that is presented in this text right here. Why is God pruning back these branches that are producing fruit? Why would God let his children, the children that are going to Bible college, his children that are studying the word with so fervor and a study and embedding in their heart, his children that are going across these divisions, his children that are in other countries starting underground churches and defying the government that uh, says that God doesn't exist and that he is illegal. Why is he cutting these branches? Why is he allowing these bad things to happen? The example Jesus is using here is of a vineyard and of grapes. And grapes are a funny little plants, but they only produce fruit on new growth. A vine that was doing well one year and produced fruit wonderfully one year, the next year would not produce unless it's cut back. They only produce on new growth. God sometimes breaks us. God sometimes prunes us in order that we may grow and produce more fruit. Take our brothers in the underground persecuted church, for example. According to the Voice of the Martyrs, right now, through COVID-19, we are seeing a new generation of persecution, and it is coming down hard as people try to start online churches, and governments are coming in and arresting people, and killing people, and they're seeing this great persecution, greater than before, but they are also seeing the fastest growing underground church movement, even among this persecution. The new growth is producing fruit rapidly. It's not only producing fruit, but it's producing fruit that makes fruit. Even among great persecution and imprisonment leaders. As creatures of the word, as branches that are going to produce fruit, we have to be patient in the pruning. We have to know that when God breaks us, we are broken, that we still have hope because he's breaking us that we might produce new fruit. And pruning is only one piece of this puzzle. Trusting the garden and being gardener and being patient to prove the only one thing. We also must abide in the vine. The next verse goes on to say, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
Remain in me as also I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. When we first started online church, when we were sent home, uh, and I came to Bale Christian Church and started online church, our numbers were kind of booming. And I looked at Facebook and I saw people that I haven't seen something positive about for a long time posting praises. Posting praises to God and saying, God triumphs over COVID-19 and God is in control. And this even came into conversation with the president as he said, Easter Sunday, we're going to be back in church. But notice, I've noticed in our numbers and Facebook posts and talking to people that this began to taper off right after this. This reflection, this reflected our numbers, reflected in the posts I saw, and it reflected in my own assignments for school as despair started to set in again. Two months ago, brothers, we were all together in a classroom at this time. Two months ago, we were, t- we were together in a little pub, learning together, growing together, learning from each other, in community. And then we were separated. However, this separation has taken our little circle and it has spread it spread our influence all over the Northwest. Boise Bible College's little bubble and influence on the couple churches that students serve at and the churches student at has taken that bubble, those churches, and has spread it all over the Northwest. We're all over Oregon, Idaho, we're up in Montana, down in Nevada and Utah, Arizona, even some on the other coast. God has took our small influence in Boise and spread it like crazy. But brothers, as preachers, as witnesses, as disciples, this means nothing. It means nothing that we are spread out and we have new people and new people to influence if we don't abide in the vine, if we don't continue our studies. Seniors, uh, students that this is your last class. This is the last time you're gonna see people for a while. I urge you over the summer and into your next step that you would continue your studies, that you would continue to prep sermons, that you would continue to dig into the word and ask questions and read commentary and just keep your sword sharp. Because as Jesus says, we need to abide in the vine. And if you are not attached to the vine, if you are not attached to Jesus, you can do nothing. We need to be so attached to Jesus, especially in this time, especially in the separation we have, that Jesus oozes out of us. Well, without him, we are nothing. As we abide in Jesus and we trust the pruner that he is making new growth, that he is enabling us to produce more fruit through our hard times, we also begin to change. The last section I'm going to talk about, John 15, says, And as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay his life down for one's friends. By our group and by what I know of you guys, we have all seen the movies or TV shows where a person dives in front of another person and takes the bullet. Or sacrifices themselves uh, somehow. And this, we, we can agree that this is great love. That person taking a bullet for another, or 
volunteering on self or whatever, is this great love. And Jesus reflects this love perfectly as he goes to the cross and dies for us, even like Romans 5.8 said, while we were sinners, not even for his friends, but for sinners, Jesus died for us. For his enemies, Jesus dies for us. But also, I want to look into the context of this moment right here. Where we agree that that is great love. But I think the love becomes more when we look at this context. We see on Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus rides in on the back of a donkey and declares himself as a king. On Monday, he cleanses out the temple and he declares himself as a high priest. He is the disciple's rabbi. And yet, right before the scene, he kneels down. He take he lays down his position as a rabbi, as their master. He lays down his position as a king. He lays down his position as a priest. And he serves as a servant, as the lowest servant in Washington skies. This is a great love. And it would go on to be even greater as he would not only lay down his positions, not only lay down his God-given right and authorities, but he would lay down his sinlessness, that Jesus Christ, who's been in perfect communication, perfect relationship with God, would lay down that relationship with his Father that he cherishes so much, to not, not only sacrifice his life for us, but to become sin, become the thing that's despised most by God, that God can't even be in the presence of, this son. And he calls us to also become servants. Brothers, listen to me. He, he gives up his sinless and spotless life. He gives up his position. And he calls us to do the same. He calls us to humble ourselves. Pick up our cross and follow it. Freely we have received, but we must freely. Jesus wants us to lay down our friendship, to lay down our relationships, to lay down the things that make us happy, to be patient in the prunings, to lay down our free time that we can abide in the mind that we will become servants to the world, and that we would go into our communities, that we would go into our homes and make disciples to bear fruit. And that fruit, those disciples will make disciples and bear more fruit. Brothers, trust in Father. Be patient as he prunes. Don't give in. Be as when he prunes us, he, he is developing us into men who will produce fruit. Spend your time with Jesus. Abide in the vine. As he gives us our authority. Lay down your status. Lay down your position. Lay down any power you have and serve. For freely you've received. And freely you must give. Thank you.